No Man's Sky isn't very good. Ahead of my video on Starfield, I wanted to cover some space games and... Well, reflecting on my collection of videos, I can easily conclude that this has been the most difficult game I've played on this channel. Not because of mechanical challenges, but more of a literal technical challenge. No Man's Sky rather infamously was released in a broken state. I played the game on launch, albeit a um, demo copy, which apparently was more stable than paid copies since I experienced plenty of bugs but not much in the way of crashing. Hello Games then went dark and tirelessly worked to patch the game up, and then began releasing content updates. A year or so later, I bought the game and played these initial updates. No Man's Sky had managed to climb out of Bug Valley and crested atop Mediocre Mountain. However, sometime in early 2021, they began releasing updates for the game that began to threaten the stability again. There are many internet threads documenting this phenomenon across all platforms for the game, and yes, I have tried all the methods of patching this game up, short of reinstalling Windows. I freaked out after ending the game and looking at my settings to see the frame rate was set at 144 instead of 60, which apparently can be an issue. So I played a couple more hours and it still crashed every 20 minutes, so that wasn't it. The only thing that lessened the problem, not resolved it, but just lessened the frequency, was an experimental version of the game that was released to solve some quote, rare few crashes, end quote. Hello Games managed to trip up and fall backwards back into the ravine of broken games, which isn't a very perilous fall since Mediocrity Mountain is actually just a small hill. But wait, didn't Internet Historian release a video titled The Ingoodening of No Man's Sky with a picture of Mr. Murray on the front that said the inverse of the game's title? How could the game be bad if Hello Games had worked so hard to fix it? I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. All those development hurdles that apparently recontextualize Hello Games and No Man's Sky, we knew, or at least I knew since I was actually interested in the game before it came out, we knew that Hello Games was not exactly ready to deliver the goods. They were at best a double-A studio that were expected to deliver a triple-A experience. And really, they were an indie team being thrown into a world where hating developers for releasing broken games was starting to become a profitable trend on YouTube. Everything up to this point is meant to serve a simple purpose. Yes, the game is broken, and yes, Johnny Traveler, I'm sure it works fine on your system every night that you go home to play exclusively this game. You, however, have to hear about my 20-hour playthrough that only 15 hours ended up registering in the save file because the game, on average, would crash every 34 minutes. Because literally every single time I had to boot up No Man's Sky, which was often, given the aforementioned crash statistics, I had to contemplate playing any of the hundreds of other games that I own that don't crash more frequently than the soundtrack symbols. Or any of the games that people like to request, or doing anything else with my life. In No Man's Sky, there is no manual saving. In order to save, you either have to get out of your ship or use a save point. To use a save point, you have to place an object down, so here is what a quick save would often look like. And here is what the same exact function would look like in any other game. Also, this was post-launch content. You couldn't just save anywhere you wanted to in the uh, base launch game. That gets us into a really long line of questionable design decisions with the game regarding efficiency and redundancy. But I really want to stress here that I would save often and religiously because there was no telling what was going to crash the game. Which was annoying because No Man's Sky will save when you exit your ship, but not when you get into it. So often before leaving stations, I have to do this dance of getting into the ship, out of the ship to save my progress, for everything I had done on the station, and then getting back into the ship to go actually play the game. There are... There are many things which are still in the game solely to waste time. Hold E to interact with objects, turning simple, repeatable interactions into chores. When you craft complex items, you have to craft the lower tier items, which later on turns into nightmares as you search through this business card-sized crafting menu for all the reagents. 
Then you find you're missing some obscure material and realize that this is the sort of game where you're expected to farm hundreds if not thousands of resources whenever you find them. There's a reason Minecraft mod packs simplified multi-step crafting, because it's tedious and boring. Where do I start with this game? How about on foot, since that's where most of the game seems to be anyways? You made a game about the vastness of space, a game with sky in its title, and then decided that 90% of the progression will take place on the ground, and a small minority of the game would involve doing things in space. Fun thing about No Man's Sky is that it tries to do this thing with the introduction being hardcore because you're forced to survive on a hostile planet, but since there's no setting screens on the main menu, you'll be slowly dying while still tuning your graphics settings and inverting your y-axis. This is a game of health bars, because everything has them. You have a health bar and a separate life support bar. Then you have a bar for the power of your multi-tool, which is needed to break things down and separate bars for each tool you install into the multi-tool, like the terrain manipulator, which is needed to break other things, but separate things, and your gun. And then you install hazard protection upgrades to increase your time out in these dangerous worlds that have their own separate health bars. And everything is charged by something different. Oxygen for the life support, carbon for the mining beam, silicates for the terrain tool, sodium for the hazard protection stuff, ion batteries for the extra hazard protection stuff, meaning cobalt. It's like every time a bad first-person shooter would get rid of their health bar, Hello Games would steal it from their dumpster and put it into their game somewhere. This is just the health bars attached to you. Your ship also has its own set of health bars. A bar for the pulse engine to get around the system, a bar for the engine to travel between systems, even a bar for the power to just launch off of planets. These are all separate fuel systems that for some reason are not sold commercially anywhere. Nobody had the bright idea of selling fuel in this universe, so you have to synthesize. So you have to synth synthesize. Jesus Christ. So you have to synth So you have to synthesize it all yourself. And the launch thrusters, they used to actually be worse. As you may have guessed, you spend a lot of time using them, and they did not have a liberal supply of power. Oftentimes, you had to carry absurd amounts of spare fuel for them, or else you'd be spending time on every planet you land on, just getting more fuel to get off of the planet again. Hear that again. The game used to mechanically discourage the prospect of landing on and exploring planets by making the process of taking off of those planets tedious. They've changed that since the last time I played. Now, most ships I have have a tech upgrade that recharges launch thrusters over time, so you only need to refuel them if you land and take off repeatedly in a very short amount of time. Stuff like that makes this a nightmare game to cover, since I have memories of four, maybe even five different times I've played the game floating around. Also, bases. Someone took a look at this game about traveling and exploring the universe and said that what it really needed was a mode to set down some roots, which is fine, I guess. There are plenty of planets I wouldn't have minded living on. The issue is that there is no good system for living in the big ships. You can, but it was highly repetitive having to constantly climb these stairs to access the base part of the ship. It's also kind of buggy. So I just lived out of my normal spaceship. It's a shame if you want to live a Firefly or Star Trek fantasy, having a mobile base and exploring the stars. It was not a big deal to live out of my minivan because almost every system had a space station, and every space station has a teleporter that goes straight back to your planetary base. Yeah, I named mine after a request for the game to stop crashing. The thing is that base building itself has changed over time. Not only has it been added post-launch, but they've also reworked it. Now instead of starting with these circular rooms, I have to earn them by digging up buried tech fragments littered absolutely everywhere for some reason. Until then, I'm living in a space shanty. There's also now a power system, or maybe it was always there? I, I don't know. I just put down two solar panels and literally forgot the mechanic even existed. And that's feature creep. What is the point of having an underdeveloped power system? Why not just say the base is lined with nano solar panels or something? The mechanic doesn't go anywhere. It's not like I keep expanding my base and running out of power like in a Minecraft mod pack, where power considerations are the constant limiter to everything that you do. I seriously can't stress how dumb it is that all of my power woes were solved by two Tesla branded solar panels, including powering my multiversal teleporter that transcends the boundaries of a universal level reality reset. I shit you not, this thing can transcend dimensional boundaries when it isn't causing my game to crash. 
And the funny thing is that the first base update reworked the progression for recipes, but at some point, they reworked the space anomaly to include merchants that sell a lot of these same recipes. So there was an awkward moment where I got a quest that was supposed to reward a recipe for microprocessors that I already knew. And no, this is not a tech tree, this is a vendor. The currency is nanites. There is a short storyline involving the base, but it's tedious and goes literally nowhere, probably because it was one of the first updates to the game, but I don't really want to talk story yet. So what is it you do in this game? Basically, you go around collecting resources for two purposes. To refill your bar so you can continue to collect resources, and to build upgrades that allow you to collect resources more efficiently. It's mostly just progression for the sake of progression, which is not a new observation, but out of everything they have updated or changed, the core of the game, which was the most tedious part back in the day, is still largely unchanged. Doing anything other than upgrading the exosuit storage, mining, and warp engine upgrades is pretty much a waste of time. I mean, of course, it's all dependent on how you prefer to spend your time. I can guarantee there's going to be something I complain about that could be solved by a dozen hours grinding and some new upgrades. But I don't want to do that. Just like how I don't want to play survival mode, and especially not any kind of permadeath mode. I've been down those paths before, it's not fun. There's not a challenge to overcome because the game has square wave difficulty. Non-existent, and then bam, you're dead. I don't feel like crafting a bunch of combat upgrades for the dozen or so times I ever actually fought anything in this game. The game crashed more often than I had combat encounters. Maybe I would be more amiable to the idea if the game was more stable, and also the beginning of the game wasn't dreadfully tedious. Like if the permadeath mode started on the first space station instead of doing the little dance on the first planet every time. but. But it's doing a thing with the story, so I guess. After you find your ship and repair it, you're set loose out into the world. Now, in a sense, you have freedom. However, that freedom is massively overstated. In reality, you have two quest lines to follow, which aren't really exclusive. Initially, it was just the Atlas path. You would find these Atlas stations and build up this series of Atlas stones, the act of which would push you through the game's progression. Occasionally, you would also run into this space anomaly, which could provide some small assistance either exploring or doing the Atlas story. Then Atlas Rises came out, which added a second storyline to the game. The thing is that it's tedious and boring. Basically, it starts with you investigating hints of another traveler named Artemis, along the way meeting additional travelers named Apollo and Noel, who aid in this endeavor. Eventually, however, you figure out that Artemis is dead. Try to link up with Apollo and fail, and find out what Null's problem is and what he did to the Atlas. Then you make a choice regarding that Atlas. The problem is that the storyline I just described is spaced out by a lot of filler. The best part is the stage where this guy Null has you investigate the histories of the aliens you meet out in the galaxy. The Gek, the Corvax, and the Viking. If you ask me to explain it, here's exactly how long it would take. You would ask Null, since he already knows, and he would say, the Viking had the Sentinels under control, and then the Gek, who used to be a militaristic species, conquered the Corvax and the Viking. Then the Corvax used Nanites to corrupt their young and turn them into merchants. And then the Viking decided to go back to hunting Sentinels and helping the travelers. Here is how it actually goes. You go to a Viking system and find a Viking cartographer. He gives you a task to fly somewhere out in the system and get a tablet, then come back. He then tells you about the Viking, then you have to go to a space anomaly, run all the way up to the top of this place, and have a single dialogue with Nada and Polo, the guys who run the place, who don't really contribute anything to this part of the story. Then you go to a Corvax system, find a Corvax cartographer. He gives you a task to fly somewhere out in the system and get a cube, then come back. He then tells you about the Corvax, then you have to go to the space anomaly, run all the way to the top of this place, and have a single dialogue with Nada and Polo, the guys who run the place, who don't really contribute anything to this part of the story. Then you go to a Gek system, find a Gek cartographer. He gives you two tasks to fly somewhere in the system to do something, then come back. He then tells you about the Gek, then you have to go to the space anomaly, run all the way up to the top of this place and have a single dialogue with Nada and Polo, the guys who run this place who don't really contribute anything to this part of the story. Then you find a hollow terminus and call Null, who tells you that he already knew all of this and only did this for your benefit. I would like to emphasize that this game does in fact have a telephone that you do use to contact people remotely, including people in alternate realities. But, no, go through all the loading screens, it's not like they were 
big culprits of the crash demon. The game makes you go through this fucking song and dance routine with Noel, Nada, and Polo to eke out the basic lore of this universe, which, like, who fucking cares? I mean genuinely, who cares about this? There is zero reason this information had to be delivered this way, considering it has zero impact on the broader story. But the game acts like this is intensely profound information that reshapes our understanding of the setting. But they're literally NPCs. I, I don't mean in the game, but even in the setting, they're disposable NPCs purpose-built to be rungs on our ladder. It's a shame, too. On the launch version of the game, you had to piece this information together by exploring these ruins. It used to be one of the main things I would do since I wanted to learn the alien languages, which is a pointless activity anyways. You'd explore the ruins, and they would tell you the story indirectly. It felt like if Hello Games had just waited a couple years, some YouTuber would have come along and done some narrative deep dive or lore series on this stuff, but instead they opted to make it more blatant when people complained. Another instance of needless padding are the hollow terminuses. I established earlier that there is a phone in the starship, and the other travelers can even call you on it, so why are we bothering with the hollow terminus? It's padding. Instead of ending a mission, having a phone call in my ship, and then going to the next objective, I instead have to wait for the icon to pop up, spend a minute flying there, usually to an approximate location instead of just pointing us straight to it, then landing, climbing to the top of this giant tower for some reason, and finally having the phone call. It is time-wasting. Moreover, the structure of the Atlas Rising stories is paced where you will slingshot through progression. Instead of completing objectives as you travel to the galactic core or wherever you want to go, instead you will find parts of the story where you will spend hours in a single star system. I mean, the base quest line literally takes place on a single planet, likely chosen by the game instead of you since the planet you're told to build on is one of the most peaceful paradise worlds in the galaxy and you will not find others like it. I hope you like whatever color it is. And that brings up the universe No Man's Sky has created. This is the main feature of the game and... Okay, it's impressive considering the team size, but why? It's like stumbling across the world's largest horsecock sculpture at 25 meters tall. It's impressive, but you have to question the artist's priorities. No Man's Sky's universe is planetocentric, which is a word used to describe how some people conceptualize the universe as revolving around the planet. Well, everything in No Man's Sky revolves around planets, rather than something like Space Engine, which is heliocentric, or revolves around stars. The planets do not orbit or move. Rather, the stars and even universe will move around whatever system you're currently in. Every other planet or moon in the system is then tidally locked and hangs in the sky. Tidal locking causes an object to have constant location. It's something that does happen in nature, but not all the time. This is not the kind of game someone with a genuine passion in astronomy or space should play, because at best they will be mildly disappointed and at worst they will be constantly distracted by how bad the representation of space is. The game is firmly, foundationally, rooted in science fantasy. It's like The Force Awakens, when they look up in the sky and you can see the other planets in the movie from the ground. It's how a Reddit bro who tells you to just trust the science will accept things, because you're just missing the forest for the trees, man. The focus is on the planets, so let's talk about them. You are as likely to find a dead rock or a gas giant in No Man's Sky as you are to find a planet teeming with life in our actual galaxy. And yes, I'm aware that if I wanted to explore a realistic universe, I could just turn on Space Engine. It's fun enough. I have no issue dealing with the vastness of space. The problem is that Space Engine is not a game, but No Man's Sky is. I don't care for exploration for the sake of exploration. I like to solve problems. Fuel, resources, currency, and upgrades are simple enough problems to routinely solve to make exploring in No Man's Sky fun enough where it can get old after an hour in Space Engine. The sad part is, you can actually end up in a galaxy which is slightly more realistic with its worlds, increasing the commonality of dead rocks, but you have to effectively beat the game once to see it. Even then it's a stopgap. You'll never encounter gas giants or their moon systems, and I'll never be comfortable with how things are spaced out. The goal is to be arcadey, where players can pop into a system and scan all the planets as soon as possible. And since the planets are absolutely tiny, that means they have to be practically touching to be visible. But cucks on Reddit will defend the planets being the size of cities because if they were bigger, people would never have a reason to leave the starting planet. Right. 
because nobody has ever decided to explore space in the real world where the Earth is 12.7 thousand kilometers in diameter with millions of different species of animals and dozens if not hundreds of different biomes. James Webb launched, but what next? I don't know dude, we could try actually using the fucking thing that we spent half a decade trying to put up. Anyways. You could probably do more realistic planets with like holographic displays on the cockpit to show where they are so you still preserve the aspect of scouting the system upon arrival without totally breaking my balls here. Either that or get rid of the monobiomes. Yes, every square inch of the planet is the same with the exception of planets sometimes having oceans. It wouldn't be that big a deal to me if Big Bertha up there wasn't taking up 90% of the sky. Or if planets being closer together wouldn't be an issue if there was a polar ice cap. But Mars has more biomes than No Man's Sky planets. There is a trippy element to realizing an objective on the planet above me is at a different angle, but to be honest that would be possible if it was the perspective size of the moon, because the trippy part is the objective marker, not the planet being close to me. I don't need it to be realistic where each planet in the system is a little dot, and I'm actually pretty okay with where the timing of inter-system travel is at. A minute is long enough to make traveling between planets a resource consideration without making the trip take so long that it becomes boring. So if planets are further apart, then ships would need to be made faster to keep that the same. Then you have the lack of orbital mechanics. I'm not expecting a realistic planetary simulation, because let's be honest, it would probably end in a disaster. But if a planet has a moon, then maybe the moon should, you know, orbit the planet. Or at least rotate. I mean, the only moon-like part of moons in this game is that they're smaller than the host planet. But since the host planets are small, that means the moons are so small you can observe their curvature just by standing on a small hill. The thing is, adding orbital mechanics for moons would make systems more dynamic. The longer you stay in a system, the more it changes. And you have the biomes. Pretty much every planet in the game has life in some form. Even if that life is a single weird energy creature. Again, it's that science fantasy aspect of there being crystal foxes on that salt planet in Star Wars. Star Wars doesn't generally concern itself with dead planets. Same thing with something more in the realm of science fiction like Star Trek. They were exploring, but they had sensors, so they probably passed hundreds of dead planets every day just looking for the ones with aliens to have sex with. Which gets into the exploration aspect of the game. I'm not the first person to point this out, but this universe is already pretty well explored. I know it's that Star Trek style of exploration where it only counts when Starfleet finds it, but I think the game could actually stand to benefit from having way more unoccupied systems. I had a split second of panic when I entered an unoccupied system and realized that there wouldn't be a gas station to buy fuel and snacks at. Then I remembered those don't exist in the colonized systems anyways. It would just be cool to enter a genuinely unexplored system and realize that it'll be a lot more dangerous if anything goes wrong here. That gets into the world gen, so I have to pay off the title. No Man's Sky is Space Daggerfall. It's not like a space version of Daggerfall, it is Space Daggerfall. Complete with the indie team and the bugs. Daggerfall nerds are going to contest that claim at every front, because they hated when Jesus told them the truth. Development focus clearly went harder into the procedural generation than the mechanics, sure. But you can't help but note the similarities. Procedurally generated worlds based on seeds consistent between playthroughs, randomly generated missions and faction reputations, economies and NPCs you can meet with randomized conversations complete with learnable languages and dispositions. They were 20 years apart, but No Man's Sky made successful a formula that Bethesda had to leave behind. That's why it's so fitting to start our Starfield prep here. The only prefabricated content is the main story stuff, and in No Man's Sky, even that is procedurally targeted. It's like the nightmare child of Daggerfall and Skyrim with a space coat of paint. Sure, it's impressive that you made 18 quintillion possible planets. But why? Why would you do that? Why would you do any of that? Like Daggerfall, once you start to see the patterns, the uniqueness of your experience fades. There are 18 quintillion planets to explore, but really only like 40. There are tons of combinations of animals, but there's nothing special about them. I can't imagine some taxonomists getting days worth of fun out of a system where the animals are just combinations of existing types of preset animals. They don't eat or reproduce, they just randomly run around. You occasionally will see a predator killing things. Hell, there are usually only a dozen or so animals, even on a lush planet. And if your thing is cataloging them, then good luck to you, my man. 
because that was only possible for me on worlds with less than four creature types. If Null is serious and did actually document every single creature in his universe, then no wonder he snapped and did what he did. I would have snapped after the second planet. Oh wow, a lush garden world with really hot rain, but this time the grass is red. Truly, wonders abound. You might be thinking, hey, that's more than Space Engine. And you'd be right, but the thing is that No Man's Sky fans really pride their game on how unique the worlds are, but they really aren't? Take the Hollow Terminus. We visit it probably a dozen times. But most of them were the exact same tower, with two unoccupied buildings at the base, with some damaged machinery near one, and a buried technology fragment near the other. I kid you not, I saw this exact pattern at every Hollow Terminus in the game. The game doesn't even hold up to the scrutiny of one playthrough, let alone have any kind of repeat playability. Just because this is the fourth time playing the game doesn't mean I actually ever completed the game up to this point. I only stuck with it this time because of the channel. Otherwise, I'd have gone back to Potion Craft. Man, this game is fun, and more importantly, functional. You have to explore this map and find efficient ways to travel it in order to craft these effects and create potions that will sell for more than you spent buying the materials to make them. Oh wait, I'm not reviewing this game. Shame. You should try it out. So let's talk about the story. A big part of Atlas Rises is about how the Travelers, a race of people that the player belongs to, are trying to meet each other, but they can't do it. Artemis tries and fails because she dies before we can find her, and I'm assuming female pronouns because that's what Artemis the god was. Apollo tries and fails because we realize that even if we're standing at the same point, our worlds aren't actually connected. This seems to me to be a reference to a pretty infamous case where two people managed to link up and try to find each other, to no avail. Even though there were more concrete confirmations of a lack of multiplayer in the launch version of No Man's Sky, this moment was a real nail in the coffin for Hello Games, for a lot of people. Sure, they had promised big, and there were some pretty understandable reasons for why the game turned out the way it did, between the flood and the simple pressures of being expected to ship so many copies due to their agreements, but Sean Murray and Hello Games were caught in a flat-out lie about multiplayer. Because the chances of two players ever crossing paths in a universe this big is pretty much zero. The main thing to learn from this is that, while it is true that it is improbable that two players would run into each other, saying that it's technically possible but statistically improbable only encourages people to try. No Man's Sky has multiplayer today, and in my travels I don't think I ever found a system discovered by another player, so nearest I can tell players who aren't actively looking for each other but are still connected won't ever really meet anybody. Anyways, this story seemed to have motivated Hello Games writing, because afterwards they would increasingly ramp up the multiplayer components while telling a story about it. Apollo and our attempt to meet is exactly what happened to those players on the first day of the original game's launch. After some updates, multiplayer started as messages that could be left between players, and upgraded to events, where players could see dots that represented the other people. Not full multiplayer, but signs. That's when Next came, bringing with it full-scale multiplayer. I haven't tried it, because honestly it sounds like a nightmare. I mean, even if the crashes were fixed again, I can't imagine enjoying this game cooperatively. Not every game is like Morrowind and has surprisingly robust cooperative magic mechanics, despite having initially been billed as a single-player game. Generally speaking, games meant for cooperative play have to be built from the ground up to mechanically support that. Imagine that bit about learning about the history of the aliens in the game. Now imagine having to do all that with three of your friends over Discord. If anything, you might be better off playing it cooperatively in a couch co-op style on survival mode, where you pass the controller on death. Now that's not an official review or anything since I didn't play it. It just seems weird to see a let's play of someone playing out a story about how travelers can't meet up while playing in a mode where travelers have met up and are exploring together. Double weird since they reworked the space anomaly to also have a bunch of travelers just hanging around. Including one guy who is definitely a shammy reference, which... I'm not sure how to interpret. The problem is that at its core, it's still just No Man's Sky. I had this problem with Cyberpunk, where I was told everything was getting better with the game, but it turns out all my original observations about the game are still accurate. Except obviously with this one, I never published my original No Man's Sky video. Yes, that existed, and no, not even I can find a copy. Not even the script. I really am not expecting much from Hello Games. Honestly, most of my issues have more to do with the community surrounding them. You guys realize these people encourage their customers to buy the game on their website, 
to make getting refunds more difficult, right? They didn't have a redemption arc. They did literally the only thing that would guarantee they could continue to have jobs in the future. Can you seriously imagine a reality where Hello Games tried to sell a new game if they had never fixed No Man's Sky? Even if the company dissolved, they'd have trouble finding work anywhere else in the industry. And don't act like it's a charity. These updates may have been free, but the game is not. At their small size, the revenue of new players attracted by the updates makes updating the game itself a profitable venture. The best thing Hello Games can do is just move on at this point, which they are. They are making a new game and keeping their cards close to their chest, which is good. I will say that at present, their strengths appear to be in visual design and a bit of programming wizardry. The result isn't very good, but technically the procedural generation stuff is very impressive. And the game has a really cool aesthetic. Let's finish out on some writing stuff, since this is a weak point for them, which isn't surprising considering they started with, like, Joe Danger. Alright, the core of the problem is this stupid simulation meme the game is built around. Hey, everyone, wouldn't it be meta if we were in a simulation? What if there was, like, another layer of the simulation that we put dead Artemis into? What if there was a layer of the simulation above this one? I've always detested the idea of simulation theory, if only because it gives people a really bad excuse to be nihilistic. It starts with the assumption that digital things aren't real, which isn't true. NFT meme here. Just because this video is being digitally projected doesn't mean it exists intangibly. There are like electrons passing bits of information that represent this video, the same way your consciousness is a product of electricity generated by neurons. That is to say, if we were being simulated, even as code, we would still physically exist in some capacity in the higher plane. We just wouldn't have the access to do anything with that existence. Of course, that's making a big assumption about the laws of reality of, or our simulators, but that's a whole other topic. We are still real even when simulated. Realness is not determined by willpower or cognition or anything dumb like that, only by tangibility. Even if we find out we're being simulated, it changes nothing. People are still hungry and still have bad tastes in video games. I guess there might be some cause for feelings of insignificance, but look around. Even if we exist in the top layer of reality, we are still cosmically insignificant. You are one of a species of 7 billion. Tun 618 is a black hole that has a mass of 66 billion suns, which apparently is more mass than the entire Milky Way galaxy. Even if we are created by a higher power, we are still insignificant. Nothing changes, so why be all emo about it? Anyways, the player and the travelers are placed in this simulated world in order to explore. The problem is that the game is kind of vague about stuff, so I'm going to have to make assumptions. But I believe the point of all this is to gauge their responses to the simulation so that they can try and correct the currently crashing simulation- well, crashing meme, huh? The game is littered with the number 16, which is the number of minutes until the simulation crashes. However, since it's a computer program, that could actually be a very long time from the Traveler's perspective. It is long enough for Noel to fully document all 18 quintillion planets, hence his robotic form. So each instance is interested in seeing how the Travelers react to the simulation. Artemis just wants to explore worlds and make friends, which I think represents both Hello Games' perception of their audience before the launch, as well as the audience they have been trying to build with their post-launch content. However, at present, the audience didn't manifest, meaning that Artemis is guaranteed to perish in the attempt. Artemis is replaced narratively with Apollo, a traveler who viewed the world cynically. He merely focused on his own progression, and even serves as a vehicle to push players to follow the base building story. In a way, he represents half of the player base that their initial vision of No Man's Sky actually got. Then you have Noel, a traveler that represents player entitlement. Noel is the other half of the players, the ones who want to see everything, the ones who push against releasing the Atlas because their own personal progress may be lost, the ones who don't accept the story as is and so made the simulation, or metaphorically the game in this case, worse as a consequence of their actions. Finally, you have the player, a character in themselves since we're often told what we're feeling and how we react to things. I have the hardest time reading this guy due to the inherent conflict between my desire to have my own feelings, which are very different from his, and dealing with his reactions to the world. It's often a case of being told rather than shown, which is fine, but I don't see why I need to have my reactions also be told to me rather than simply being told what is happening. 
and being allowed to have my own reactions. Being the player is part of the reason the simulation is different, why this simulation changes things. Or maybe many of them do. The base building story arc gives big implications that the player in past iterations is the person who arranged all the contracts for the current simulation. Honestly, with the treatment I just gave it, No Man's Sky's story is still lacking. The Atlas wants the player to experience creating worlds, for some reason. Is it just an interface for the simulation, or does it have desires? Why is it interested in sharing the joys of creation? Why does it feel pain about the increasingly corrupted and failing simulation? The idea might be that the root of the corruption that is killing the simulation is some kind of intelligence the Atlas has formed, and that the Atlas' obsession with creating worlds is the problem. I don't know. I'm generally pretty quick to pick up on meanings, but with No Man's Sky, I really just feel myself writing for Hello Games. They wanted to make a game where the story was told through exploration, where you figured out the alien cultures through studying their monuments and interacting with them, and where you figured out the Atlas by dealing with it. And then when that wasn't obvious enough, they made the Atlas Rises story to try and be a lot more obvious about it. I just think the core problem is that like the co-op, you can't retrofit this thing to be better. I do think it's funny that Hello Games tried to tie bugs into the story like the anomalous worlds you encounter are actually products of the failing simulation. That's a really neat package, being able to write off your own issues as being part of the narrative. Why are the aliens universally present with no clear boundaries or civilization? It's just part of the simulation. Why are the planets so terrible? Oh, it's part of the simulation. Why are the worlds hostile and there's a need for survival? It's parallel to God placing mortal limitations on humans to test them for the afterlife. The Atlas isn't a god, it's just bad at communicating its intentions, which is the biggest metaphor of all. That the Atlas is Hello Games. A misunderstood entity that only wanted to share the joys of exploration, but was pigeonholed into a higher, if unfair, expectation of greatness. That's cool, I guess. But it isn't good. I would much rather have a more straightforward experience. The Atlas Rises story should not have been a recontextualization of the Atlas storyline. It should have been a new thing. It should have been about going out and experiencing the world, living like a pirate or a smuggler or a bounty hunter. Going out and meeting the leadership of the civilizations and engaging in wars and conflicts over resources. Basically your traditional science fiction story. A distraction inside the simulation. Then maybe a third of the way through you warp into a system and are surprised by an ominous Atlas interface. If the player investigates the Atlas, then the realization that everything you have been doing up until that point has been a simulation is greater. Did anything you do matter if it's all just digital? You could leave that question up to the player, with them maybe realizing that even if their story was just a simulation, it was still a real experience that you had. It could have been a profound metatextual story about the realness of video game narratives. Having two storylines about realizing you're living inside a computer is redundant. Having a storyline about how there isn't multiplayer is stupid if trying to develop the game into having a multiplayer experience was an internal goal. I really hate how often indie developers fall back on, wow, isn't it weird we're in a video game story? Guys, we're in a video game. Like, yeah, I know, trust me, your game isn't so immersive that I forgot about reality. If anything, it comes off as compensating. Like the devs aren't confident that they could tell an interesting real story. Or maybe there's a novelty to it. Like a bunch of programmers and artists were sitting around a table during a brainstorming meeting, realizing that nobody in the room had a passion for writing, so they settled on making the story about the game that they were creating. And that's No Man's Sky. Once I beat the story, I had a really hard time justifying playing any more of it. It's the kind of game where you play when you want to watch a long video, or a podcast, or a TV show or something. Has come off cooldown. Shiver takes a glancing blow from one of the lasers and is knocked out for a bit. When he comes to, everyone else is dead, he himself barely alive. And then he drags his smoldering remains to the portal, armed with his infinite ammo carnifex. But for me, it was the kind of game that really made me want to stop playing it and get back to work. If Bethesda learns anything from No Man's Sky, it should be that when I press E, it should do something instantly. If I see one more spinning radial in a game, I swear to fuck thanks to the patrons who support my work. You know the drill by now. Patrons get in the credits, they get early access to the videos, they get special access to talk to me on Discord, and they get status updates on what I'm working on as well as project updates for the Skyrim video.
remarkable, isn't it? For so long, humanity gazed up at the stars in wonder, 